Great, welcome everyone to the British Mandate. I'm gonna talk about these 30 years that what happened in more details between 1917 till 1947. So um, some of these like notes that we're gonna be talking today, actually uh, in 1917, what happened is the allied forces led by the British uh, general, Edmund of the Ottoman forces, as you see here in the picture, this is in the area of uh, Jaffa Gate. Britain becomes the power of Palestine and it has set for 30 years. Now, there is a common myth that was uh, said by Theodor Herzl, who was the founder of, of modern Zionism. He said, a land without a people for a people without a land and this gave the impression that the land was empty and ready to be inhabited. But this was not the case, we're going to see. The land was inhabited by Arabs, by Palestinians, and by Jews that represented 10% of the population at that, at that time. So under the wing of the British power, the Jews would be able to develop and set up their administrative uh, machinery which enabled the implementation of the Zionist schemes. So an imperialist country granted land to displace Jews that it had no right to give. So this was how the Zionist movement managed to convince the Jews to leave where they were living and move to the promised land. And to aid this, the British government decided to endorse the establishment of a Jewish home in Palestine. The Zionist movement showed total ignorance of the fact that this land had an Arab population while entrenched in its soil for many centuries. The bride is beautiful, but she is married to another man. She is married to her own people that lived in the Holy Land. Now, during this lecture, during this lecture of the British mandate, I'm going to start by talking about the Balfour Declaration and what it included and how this helped and aided more continuation of exploiting more land that at the peak led to the main revolt in 1936. There were other revolts, but the main one started in 1936 for three years and what happens of the consequences of the Second World War that affected our land here. And before the British left, they suggested a partition plan, which didn't work out. We're gonna talk more about it as well. And then how the Jews were ready to declare the state of, of Israel. So we're gonna talk more about what happened in this very important 30 years going three, through each of, uh, of these points. So the Balfour Declaration, the Balfour Declaration I'm gonna start with. Christian Zionism had deep roots in Britain, particularly among like the British leadership. Now their desire was to establish a Jewish state in Palestine and was behind Britain's quick issuing of the Balfour Declaration of 1917. Now, after discussions with the British cabinet and the consultations with Jewish leaders, the decision was made public in this letter. British Foreign Secretary Sir Arthur James Balfour convened a letter to Baron Rothschild to declare the approvement of the British cabinet. And this, the context of this letter became known as the Balfour Declaration. And it reads in part, it reads in part, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, 
or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So the Balfour Declaration is a letter that was sent in 1917 by the British Foreign Secretary, Mr. Arthur James Balfour, to Baron de Rothschild, pledged British support for the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine. So this was the golden key, like this declaration was the golden key that unlocked the doors to Palestine in which one nation, Britain, solemnly promised to a second nation, Israel, the country of a third nation, Palestine, all right? So again, in 1917, Balfour became the foreign minister who issued the historic document known by his name. And that document promised the Jews a national home in Palestine. So uh, it was a great Zionist triumph, considering that only a small fraction of the Holy Land population was Jewish. Now, no doubt the Balfour Declaration was the beginning of a tragic conflict between the Arabs and the Zionists that would last through our time even until today and likely into the future. So the term Palestine was the official historic name given to this land by the British. And this term Palestine was a geographical term applied to the people who lived here. There were Palestinian Jews, Palestinian Christians, and Palestinian Muslims. Although there was a significant Palestinian Christian minority that is often overlooked. So therefore, during the British mandate of Palestine, the term Palestinian was used to describe everyone residing in that land, whether he was Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. And that started from that period, officially. Now, the land, of course, is the birthplace of the Jewish people, and their spiritual and national identity was formed here. So they started to revive their language and to build their cities. And not only the land of Israel is just a spiritual ideal, it must become also a physical reality where Hebrew was to restore the holy tongue as the language of the people. And as a result, the 1920s witnessed the growth and the expansion of more Jewish administrative, religious, educational, cultural, and artistic institutions. Now, this is also was the time when the League of Nations was formed, which was the first worldwide intergovernmental organization to promote international cooperation to achieve peace and security. And the League's primary goals were settling international disputes through negotiations. Now, the League lacked its own armed force and depended on the victorious First World War allies to enforce its resolutions. So through its numerous commissions and committees, it paved more the way for new forms of, of statehood for the, for the mandate. Now, based on the decision of the 1920 San Remo conference, which was another conference in Italy. The conference was attended by the four principal allied powers of the World War I, Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, awarding the mandate for Syria and Lebanon to France. You see Syria and Lebanon to France. Whereas here, Britain received Palestine, Transjordan, and Mesopotamia, which is Iraq today. So the League of Nations Council ratified the decision in 1922 without consent of the Palestinians, making the term of the mandate official. And in 1923, the mandate commenced and Britain became the mandatory power in Palestine. Later, in Two years in 1925, the Palestinians were stripped of the Ottoman citizenship. And in the same year, the Palestinian nationality was issued. Now, in 1928, during Yom Kippur, Jews tried to set up benches at the Western Wall. And this caused riots, and the British had to come in to break it up. Now, Arab nationalism was aroused and opposition to Zionism began to spread. 
And this nationalism quickly became violent with the call for political unity against Zionism and against British imperialism. Yet the waves of Jewish immigration into the Holy Land grew large enough that it arose more the Arab nationalism opposing Zionism. This in turn promoted the Jews to start forming defenses forces known as the Haganah. Now at first, this Zionist paramilitary organization, actually the Haganah, the word means defense, was formed secretly and illegally, and the British overlooked it. But in 1929, the Haganah was officially formed, and it, this Jewish underground military organization grew later to be the central defense mechanism of the Zionist movement. And militarism became a value in creating Jewish pride and power. And even the British supported their activities as well. Now, later in the 1930s, we know that the Americans' doors began closing to new immigrants, and many Jews ended up coming more to Palestine in mass. So those who came were largely middle class businessmen and craftsmen. But as the Arabs were like better farmers and harder workers, and at the beginning they didn't complain about ex their exploitation, this made the younger Jews more arrogant and they looked down upon such labor. And in 1935, the Jewish population doubled and immigration and land sales surpassed all previous records. And the Arabs became increasingly afraid of a Jewish takeover now. But at the same time, like in the area of greater Syria, which is Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, and Jordan today, instability and instability in the region played a significant role in escalating immigration of the Palestinians out of these areas. And there was an increase in the awareness of Christian Arabs in Europe and the New World. And this increased the Palestinians' desire to see those countries and immigrate to them to exploit the available economic opportunities in the region. Now, after the end of the First World War, many decided to return to their birthplace, many Palestinians, but the British authorities closed the doors at a time when the doors of Palestine were wide open to Jewish immigrants. So as a consequence of British policy, only 100 applications were approved of a total of 9,000 submitted by Palestinian immigrants wanting to return to their mother country. So the British policy allowed the incoming of alien Jewish immigrants to obtain citizenship under the easiest conditions while placing numerous obstacles in the face of native born Palestinians who wanted to return to their country. So Palestinian immigrants deprived of their citizenship faced extremely difficult circumstances, both outside and inside their motherland. While the nationalism of the Arabs was a direct reaction to Ottoman Turks, oppression and European colonization, the Jewish nationalism originated in the intellectual and emotional responses to the persecutions of East Europe. So therefore the two nationalism movements appeared around almost the same time, more or less. Now, the locals in the land accepted the Jewish immigrants in the beginning, all right? Not realizing that the Jews wanted to be in control. But what happened, the Palestinian people at that time were simple, they were hospitable. They did not expect to have the land ripped away from, from them in such a short amount of time or come home to find Jews in their same beds claiming that they had purchased the house and the land. So when the Arabs woke up to what was happening, Unfortunately, it was too late and they decided to revolt. So when the Palestinians revolted, actually first attacking the Jews living in Jaffa because the city was a symbol of Jewish immigrants being the port where most Jews entered the land at that time, 
This marked the beginning of the three years of riots in Palestine that directed primarily against the Jewish settlement. Now, between 1936 until 1939, the Palestinian Arabs revolted against the Jewish immigration and the main Arab revolt took three years of organized activity to grow the Arab national movement. And they had like several goals. I'll mention three for you. One, to stop the sale of land to the Jews, then total hold on Jewish immigration, and third, the establishment of an Arab government. Now, Palestinian revolution, the revolutionists wore the kofia or hatch to hide their identity during the 1936 Arab revolt as British mandate authorities assailed anyone wearing it. But to support the revolution and prevent the revolutionists from being chased, the commanders of the revolt called on Palestinians everywhere to wear the kofia instead of the tarbush of the Turks. That was the normal dress during the Turkish period. Now, during the riots that broke out in these three years, Palestinian nationalism was aroused and violent opposition to Zionism began to spread. There had been cycles of violence earlier, but the climax of this era was the violent Arab revolts of these three years as the Jewish population doubled and more settlements were built to make facts on ground. So that period witnessed the Arab revolt in all its intensity. It was directed initially at the Jews and later at the British too. Now the outbreak included a general strike of Arab workers and the boycott of Jewish products. And the national strike against Jewish immigrants went into effect. These actions swiftly escalated against the Jews and the British. And the Palestinians were angry over the injustices they perpetrated by their British occupiers and seeing their land being overtaken by foreigners was unacceptable. Now the result was the Arab leadership being forced into exile by the British and this created a vacuum of strong leadership among the Arabs in the region. And through mass arrests, torture, and exile, the British crushed the revolt. And in the end, the British were forced to realize the problem and their handling of it made enemies of both the Jews and the Palestinians. Now, like to conclude, like, and in effect, actually, the foreigners attempted to solve the Jewish problem at the expense of the native inhabitants of Palestine. And in the process, they helped create a crisis that has threatened world peace for over half a century. And in addition, was it right and just that the burden of solving the problem of the European Jewish diaspora fell primarily on the shoulders of the Palestinian people, a people who were not responsible for the historic suffering of the Jews in Europe? Now, as a result of the revolt, the British government issued what was known as the White Paper in 1939, following the protests of the Palestinians. So the British government issued a policy statement known as the White Paper to clarify Britain's policy in Palestine. Now, the constitution suggested the establishment within 10 years of an independent state in Palestine with Arabs and Jews sharing the government. And the paper called for the establishment of a Jewish national home in an independent Palestinian state within 10 years. So the paper explains the British interpretation of the Jewish national home and affirms that there was no intention of providing for the disappearance or the subordination of the Arabic population, language or culture in Palestine. It also concluded that Jewish immigration to Palestine should be limited by both the country's economic capacity and the political consequences, bringing the Jews, Jewish population to around one third of the total in five years, after which further immigration would require Arab consent. So it restricted the Jewish immigration to Palestine to 15,000 annually for these five years, 
protecting Palestinian property rights from Zionist acquisition. And it states as well that the status of all citizens of Palestine in the eyes of the law shall be Palestinians. So whether Palestinian Jews, Palestinian Christians, or Palestinian Muslims, it was never intended that they or any portion of them should possess any other juridical status. So the High Commissioner will be given general powers to prohibit, to prohibit and regulate transfers of any land. And these powers will date from the publication of the statement of policy and the High Commissioner will retain them throughout the transitional period. It further even called restrictions of the purchase of land by the Jews. Now, this revoked actually and infuriated the Zionists, who then organized terrorist groups and launched a bloody campaign against the British and the local Palestinians with the aim of driving them both out of Palestine and thus pave the way for the establishment of the Zionist state. So Zionist groups in Palestine immediately rejected the white paper and led a campaign of attacks on British government property that lasted for several months. Now the Jewish underground groups fought British rule in various ways, some of the time jointly as part of the newly organized Hebrew resistance movements together. Now, the Second World War erupted in 1939 and continued through 1945, becoming the most widespread war in history and resulting in tens of millions of deaths and the vast destruction in many countries, including the use of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. But the major participating states in the war, we you know, were Germany, Italy, and Japan on the Axis side and on the Allies side, was the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union. This war led to extensive changes globally. Palestine was rapidly converted into a vast logistics base for the entire British army in the Middle East. Camps were built, roads paved, and airfields were installed. Now we know, of course, during the Second World War and after centuries of antisemitism and persecution, which led eventually to the Holocaust deaths of 6 million Jews under the Nazis in Germany, and not having anywhere else to go, the Jews who could came with their boats more to Palestine. And when the war ended, of course, Palestine was the only country open to take the Jews. Therefore, the rise of, the, of na na Nazis in Germany and the oppression of Jews in Europe which cultivated in the Holocaust during World War II, led to a more increase in Jewish immigration to Palestine. But even during all this, there was the combination of the Jewish struggle for independence on the one hand, and the problem of the displaced survivors in Europe who insisted on immigrating to Palestine on the other. So between 1945 and 1947, the British economy took a big hit because of the toll World War II took on them. And regardless, Britain needed to protect its interests in the Suez Canal and its empire in the India and in the East. So the British struggled during the early part of the war and let more of the locals begin to police and gain control over the region as British focus and attention were more on Hitler and on Germany. So in 1946, the fighters of the freedom of Israel bombed the British headquarters at the King David Hotel that you see in the picture. And the liberation of the land of Israel became the prime objective by means of armed struggle against Britain. In addition, 10 major bridges leading into Palestine were destroyed by the Haganah in an attempt to restrict British movements. This attack became known as the Black Sabbath. So the Zionist paramilitary organizations, the Haganah, the Irgun, and Stern, among others, escalated terrorist activities against Palestinian and British targets. And during that time, the Jews established 11 new settlements in the Negev, further south in the desert of the country, to create facts, more facts on ground as well. So the British responded by carrying out a major raid jailing Jewish leaders and 
confiscating weapons and ammunition. And the British also set up campaigns in, in Cyprus to detain immigrants trying to reach to the land. So in Palestine, the gradual decline of the British forces resulted in a more intense struggle between Jews and Arabs for control of strategic points everywhere. And the period of religious Zionism ended and that of militant Zionism began. In less than a decade, this spirit would bring about the establishment of the state of Israel. Now in 1946, the 22nd Zionist Congress, which was the first after the Second World War, planned for the immediate establishment of the Jewish state and changed the center of gravity of Jewish politics, fighting for the rights of Jews around the world, ensuring the continuity and development of its religious, spiritual, cultural, and social heritage. So for the Arabs, the aftermath of the Second World War was a bitter repetition of the deception of the First World War as well. So once again, people had made all kinds of promises to them in order to secure their collaboration or at least their neutrality. But after the war was won, the promises were broken by a malevolent confidentiality of rich Europeans. Now, this is important, uh, what I'm going to talk about now. Especially in 1947, the British government announced that it intended to give up the mandate and to hand the whole problem of Palestine to the United Nations. Actually, the United Nations General Assembly approved a partition plan by a vote of 33 to 13 with 10 abstentions, largely through the influence of the USA. The UN voted to create two separate states, a Jewish state which covered 55% of the land and an Arab state which would include the remaining 45% of the land. So while the Jews in Palestine, you have to know, appeared to accept the plan initially, the Palestinian Arabs totally rejected it. More war broke out with both sides increasing their terrorist activities. Now, by 1947, the population of the land had grown to around 2 million people with 30% Jews and 70% Palestinians. Now, the Jews were concentrated in the cities, making them about 50-50% like in Tel Aviv, like in Jerusalem and in Tiberias, in these big cities. But in the countryside, in the countryside, however, was still about 90% Arab. So the 30% of the Jewish population got 55% of the land and the 70% of the population of the Palestinians got only 45% of the land. So this was not perfect, but was the best result for the Zionists. So the Arabs, of course, did not agree. Now, Palestine was compromised of less than 10,000 square miles, all right? Of this, the Arabs were to retain only 4,300 square miles, while the Jews who represent one third of the population were allotted 5,700 square miles. So the Jews also got the better land, they received the fertile coastal belt, while the Arabs were to make do for the most part with the hills. So overnight, the Committee of Nations solemnly laid the foundations of a new moral order by which the Jews, the great majority of whom had been in Palestine less than 30 years, were deemed to have equal and even superior rights to those of the Palestinians who had lived there for centuries. Thus, in 1947, the United Nations accepted the resolution to divide Palestine into a Jewish state and a Palestinian state. And to do so, they came up with this ridiculous map that you see here. So the United Nations resolution had three parts. One, to divide the land between the two people according to the concentration of the population, two states with free passage corridors. Two, Jerusalem and Bethlehem were to become international zone under United Nations control 
since the cities were important for everybody, and three, the British were to go home. So by 1947, there were now two communities living parallel lives. We have the Jewish community of about half a million people who were expecting and hoping to become a state. And there was the Arab Palestinian community of about one and a half million people who also expected to become a state. Yet when the United Nations came up with this plan, they chose to give the larger portion of the country to the smaller community. So for the Jews all over the world, it was a day of joy. The Jews were ready to give up Jerusalem for a tiny home was better than nothing. But for the Palestinians, of course, it was a disaster. It was not fair that these strangers had come from other lands to take what had been theirs for centuries. So just by looking at the map, it is unbe unbelievable that anybody expected this plan to work. It didn't even last one day. So the, the plan was thrown into the garbage of history and never succeeded. The land was too small to divide in such a way without hurting the people. Now, I like to use like this biblical example. And this reminds me of the story of King Solomon solution to cut the baby in half to, to, to determine who the baby belonged to. For two women claimed the baby as their own. But for the Palestinians, there was no way this division of the land could be accepted. The land was their baby. It was not fair for the Palestinians to agree on such a plan. This was the land the Palestinians had lived in their whole lives. They felt it wrong to divide or even give any portion of it away to someone else. Now, in the wake of the United Nations resolution to partition, to, to partition plan of Palestine, the British decided not to implement the, the resolution themselves, declaring instead they would finally leave Palestine. And after all, this plan, which was a good deal for the Jews, but it was a bad deal for the Arabs. So the mandate officially ends with the withdrawal of the British from Palestine. The British had promised independence for both Arabs and Jews, but all had become upset after almost 30 years of failure to keep that promise. Even before the last British left from Haifa Bay, and the last British flag was lowered, the Jewish state was declared, seizing the opportunity to fill the power vacuum left by the British. For the first time in thousands of years, the Jews had a chance to reclaim their original homeland. As the last British soldier left from Haifa Bay, Commissioner Alan Cunningham saluted the lowering of the British flag, leaving an imbalance of power in the land. So, facing persecution on a scale that amounted to genocide, the Jews were motivated to make a life or death attempt to create a state of their own. The Palestinian Arabs, a Semitic and largely Muslim people, concluded that they were being required to pay for the anti-Semitic sins of the Christian West. So the United States and Western Europe gave support to the creation of Israel, and have continued to support it. In fact, some Arabs came to feel that in Western nations, pro-Zionism for Jewish abroad was the natural corollary of continued anti-Semitism at home. So in 1948, the Jews finally had a historic window of opportunity to create a state for themselves. There were no more rulers, which created an unfamiliar situation. At four in the afternoon on Friday, before the Shabbat, the state of Israel was declared. And it was the act of a nation fighting for its future, a declaration of independence. This whole ceremony was made in a secret, in secret, and they chose this location for the declaration because the building was one of the most secure structures around, having small windows, the one that you see in, in the picture, this was like the home of the mayor of Tel Aviv at that, at that time. Now, intense struggle actually started between Jews and Arabs for control of strategic points. 
This led to a civil war for six months. The Zionist forces started a massive campaign of ethnic cleansing and sucked in five Arab other countries into this vacuum of power. Now, the enormous Arab superiority in manpower, weapons, training, and control of Tehran meant that within a few weeks of their initial push, they would automatically succeed in their objectives. The Jews were like outnumbered. There were 600,000 Jews at that time against more than a half and a million Arabs, plus those joining in later from Egypt, Transjordan, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, which led, which started the War of Independence of 1948. Now, we will talk more in details about the War of Independence or what the Palestinians call as the catastrophe in the next, in the fourth webinar lecture, where we're going to talk more about the Israeli and the Jordanian period. And we're going to talk what happened after in the war and after the war and how many Palestinians became refugees and how they lost almost 80% of their land and then how the war stopped by the agreement with the Jordanians about the Green Line, and also what resulted of, of the wars, uh, uh, the War of Independence. So this is going to be our fourth lecture, talking more into details about the Israeli-Jordanian period between 1947 till 1967. And again, I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, the British period, and I'm happy to answer your questions. And thank you for joining us again.